everybody, Daniel here from Basement Tech. Regular viewers of the channel will remember I'm converting the CNC shark behind me to Linux CNC. The topic for this episode is uh, inductive limit switches. Before we get there, though, a couple items of housekeeping. Um, number one, I should have said at the outset, the reason I'm using this machine is that I have it. It was given to me for free. It's not my favorite machine in the world, and I think there were some design choices that maybe could have been made differently. But it's going to be fun uh, to use when it's all done within the limitations of the machine itself. Um, secondly, I have to apologize for the audio. In the last couple of um, videos, I realized the microphone wasn't working as well as it could be. Hopefully it's working better now. Um, finally, I went down a couple of rabbit holes um, since the last video. Well, actually one was the topic of the last video, which was um, the motor heating. I hope you found that interesting. I was disappointed that there wasn't more commentary on that topic because, as I said, it was kind of a believe it or not. Um, the second topic was CPU latency. Linux CNC documentation talks a lot about the latency of the computer you're using. Using some posts I found from uh, you know the past when computers were slower, I managed to cut the latency in half, which is kind of important for Linux uh, CNC. And the third one relates to the smoothness of the motion of particularly the X and Y axis. And I think that one's going to be down to a cleaning and lubrication operation. Anyway, I'll leave these topics to the end of the series and get back to the previously scheduled program, which is inductive limit switches. Let's dive in. Well, this is the limit switch I'm using. I'm using it because I have it. I got it at a ham fest for about $5, I think. And it's probably a, I don't know, 80 to $100 sensor. Um, there are many others available, uh, lower cost from a lot of CNC hobbyist uh, sites, and they'll work just as well. But this is the one I had, so that's the one I'm using. Um, you can see it has specs like this. One of the most important ones is the range in which it um, trips. And this one, you can see it says eight millimeters. That's going to be very workable for um, this machine. Uh, first step is to get it uh, mounted up. So let's do that and then we'll move on to the wiring. This T-nut slash uh, channel system that's provided with the CNC Shark, I assume it was original equipment, provides a really convenient way to um, mount the sensors. What you can see here is I'm just loosening the nuts on the end um, of the uh, leftmost two channel sections, and um, that will allow me to slide them out of the way uh, and um, add a couple of T-nuts on the bottom, maybe reverse T-nuts, uh, to mount the sensors. Obviously a cleaning is necessary. Maybe that's going to be the subject of a, another video. So uh, just replacing those two sections, uh, snugging it up, and now I have some nice studs on which to uh, mount uh, this bracket. So just like on the X-axis, I had to do a little uh, aluminum um, machining. This is pretty simple just some about 16th inch thick uh, aluminum channel that's going to mount as shown here with a couple of holes uh, drilled in it um, to accommodate uh, the sensor. Now this one doesn't have to be quite as beefy as the one on the x-axis because there's really nothing touching this. No switch is going to be pushed against. It's uh, simply um, holding the sensor in place in a reliable way. As you can see the sensor is just going to fit uh, through the hole like I showed and um, and trip when this piece of metal that I'm trying to give you the sight line of here comes within that eight millimeter or so spec. Let's put the mechanical stuff on pause for just a second and talk about the sensor itself. You can see in the little picture the magnification I provided in the upper right uh, which, by the way, is just a picture of this convenient little diagram that they put right on the sensor for us. There are four wires that go into this sensor. Um, brown, black, white, and blue. Brown and blue are the power supply voltages. This sensor, also as you can see from the diagram, 
take between, will accept between 10 and 30 volts as the power supply voltage. That's gonna be supplied on the brown and the blue wire. So let me go ahead and connect those up. These two wires, by the way, just come from a uh, power supply. So the brown is the positive and the blue is the negative. What I'm gonna show you is how the sensor actually works you know, out here in the wide open where you can really see what's going on. So there are two outputs from this sensor. One is called normally closed equivalent and the other one is normally open equivalent. And I say equivalent because it's not actually a switch closure. It's a transistor like this on the inside of the sensor that's providing the functionality. In the case of the normally open, the black wire, um, when the sensor is activated, the transistor turns on and this wire is pulled to ground. So I'm going to demonstrate with a little LED over here uh, what that actually looks like. In the case of the normally closed, the transistor is turned on in the resting state, just like the clicky switch we talked about last time. When the sensor is activated, the transistor is turned off, and uh, in this case, you would see the LED turn off. So let's connect up this, um, this little LED. I said I'm gonna use normally closed, which is the white wire. So, so what I'm going to do is take the white wire, as I indicated in the little diagram here, and connect that to the bottom end of the LED down here. Now I have to supply a positive voltage to that um, the top end of the LED, if you will. So I'm just going to do that using this clip lead, the red clip lead. I'm going to bring that over here and just clip that on to where my power supply voltage. So what I have done in effect is create this circuit that you see here. So let's power this up and uh, and show you how it works. So having powered up the sensor, you can see that the normally closed or on in the resting state output is on, the LED is turned on. When I bring a metallic object uh, close to the sensor, I hope you're gonna see that lo and behold, the LED goes off. So this is the signal that's going to be provided to the G540, much like the clicky switch signal in the last episode, that's going to tell the G540 that the Y-axis has moved close to the end of its travel. Off camera, I went ahead and mounted up that sensor, ran the wires in sort of a semi-tidy manner and terminated the raw wires with some of these terminals. Um, you can see it's going to come up just a little bit short of reaching our G540. So I made up this little, call it an extension cable, basically just a um, terminal strip on one end and some long wires on the other end to run to the G540 and power supply connections. Do remember I said I was going to just leave this wiring a little bit open um, so that it allows for easy um, experimentation and manipulation. If you're making a production system, I definitely would not recommend <laughs> leaving it this open. Put it in some sort of a protective box that keeps both um, the dust out and your fingers out from um, dangerous connections. All right, well with the wire connections made, it's time to turn to the Linux configuration wizard and get this uh, sensor going. If the number of wires here seems a little dizzying, I should just point out in the uh, Gecko 540 manual, there's a very simple diagram that looks like this. This is conceptually what we're following. I'll try to maybe do a sketch and uh, put, the, put it in the link in one of the later videos. The other one I refer to a lot is this page out of the manual that just has a list of every connection to the G540. And that's how I know what I'm connecting uh, to what. Even though clicking around on a computer is not very exciting um, YouTube content, I'm going to just show you uh, a little bit um, what I'm doing here. Again, I may come back to this in a more detailed video. I'm going to say modify my existing configuration. It is that one. And then I'm gonna click forward until I get to the point where I'm talking about wiring. That is this IO connection three. Okay, well, so that it doesn't seem like complete magic, let me lead you through my thought process for this one wire connection. This is the so-called main terminal block on the bottom 
of the G540. I've connected our new sensor to number two there on the left. Referring to this little table down here, it says input two is DB25 pin 11. Now, because I have the MESA card, I have this one extra step that this is the MESA card pinout. It says DB25 pin 11 on the left is IO14. Now, making my way over to Linux CNC, you see there IO14. So just like we configured IO13 for the x-axis, we're going to configure IO14 for the y-axis. And just like the x-axis, we're presented with some so, um, selections that make sense for us. This sensor is going to be the y-axis minimum plus the homing switch. So I make that selection and that sensor is configured. Now you may ask, why didn't we put two sensors in series, two switches in series, like we did with the x-axis? The circuitry in these inductive limit switches is sophisticated enough that I actually prefer just to put them on two separate inputs. So we're going to use a separate input for the y-axis maximum switch. The moment of truth, does it actually work? I'm creeping the y-axis toward the limit and I'm giving you this angle because that little dot under the cable is the LED that indicates when the sensor has tripped, which I hope is going to happen very shortly because we're getting very close and there it goes. Now these sensors are very predictable when it comes to ferrous or iron-based trip dogs and that's the 8 millimeters that was um, stated in the spec. Let me move around here to give you an idea of where we stopped here, which I suspect, yes, is a little closer because this is aluminum we're using as the trip dog. That's about 200 or 250 thousandths, which I think is going to be fine given the, given the predictability um, of this uh, machine. We also configured this switch as a limit, or sorry, as a home switch, so let's give that a try. The home sequence creeps toward the sensor at a very slow rate such that the place where it stops is more accurate. It will trip at the same place as when it was the limit switch, but it runs a sequence wherein it acquires that position twice and then moves away a safe half inch. Well, I'll rinse and repeat on the y-axis positive travel limit and call this one a wrap. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you really, really like it, subscribe and ask for notifications. And as always, please provide your comments. Thanks. Bye.